All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Lane. I am your Indianapolis Special Collections Librarian for the Indianapolis Public Library. And this is the third lecture this year in our ISCR lecture series. And we have one more coming up in December. Um, if you are interested in um, coming to that lecture, just type in the in the chat to add you to the email list and I'll get you added. And I'm sorry about the folks that wanted to be added last time because I accidentally closed out the Zoom before I added your name to the email list, but I made sure to print out the emails this time so I have everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, so definitely sign up for our email list so you can, um, and, and the next one will happen in December in the lecture series and it'll be with David Leander Williams, who wrote Indianapolis mm -hmm. Jazz. He's coming out with a new book in 2021, so he'll be talking about his research on that. Um, also, I sent a survey in, the, um, in your Zoom link, so please fill out that survey after the end of this presentation um, to let us know how we're doing, um, and we'll get that all figured out and corrected for you. And so now I'm gonna introduce uh, Kisha Tandy. I first met her in library school. I took her class, local history and genealogy. And I just feel like I learned so much from Kisha. And I definitely wanna share her work with you know, a wider audience um, that I now have you know, this job. And I'm just so thankful for her. I feel like I wouldn't be in this position without her and her wisdom and, and guidance throughout uh, library school. But also, I went to one of her presentations at the Indiana State Museum, and I think it was um, it was an author who he released his book on Major Taylor. And I remember um, at the end of the presentation, the author was like, "Kisha helped us find Major Taylor's father, I believe it was, in his gravesite at Crown Hill Cemetery." And that was such like a like a jaw dropping moment for the, the crowd. So it just really speaks to the kind of work that she does um, at the Indiana State Museum and for our city and for our state. Um, so without further ado, um, Kisha Tandy, she is the historic sites curator of the social of social history at the Indiana State Museum. So please take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Stephen, for that introduction. Wow, uh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. So I will just get right into it. So today we're going to talk about some of the wonderful artifacts that I have had the opportunity to collect, to work with, to use for various presentations, and to have on exhibit and as part of the experience at the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites. I am the curator of social history and in this position I work with the community and I spend a lot of time collecting, preserving, interpreting, sharing information, engaging and research. And collecting is one of the main things that I do at the museum. What do we collect? I am collecting artifacts and stories that help to tell Indiana's African-American experience. And that is a large part of what I do, but I help to collect stories from all over Indiana related to the cultural heritage. So I am looking at um, African-American history, looking at um, Latino and Lat Latinx history. I am looking at various parts of the history of Indiana. Uh, recently, I've been spending a lot of time actually working on looking and trying to find information about African-American women and their goals and their efforts on getting the right to vote. And, suffrage here in Indiana. So that has been a wonderful experience just using research to learn many new things about women who were taking their activism and their church activity and their community activities and using it to further their rights and to gain and achieve the right to vote. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that, that's kind of an overview. And so you can see here in this picture, uh, I am with two wonderful women. Um, in the center is the late Mrs. Wilma Gibbs Moore, who was at the Indiana Historical Society. And uh, 
Stephen gave me those wonderful um, comments and, and I will say that Mrs. Wilma was so much to me and was an incredible mentor and really showed and helped me uh, to be a better researcher and really encouraged me to go to library school. And so I will be forever grateful for what, what she did for me. And then next to her is Mrs. Uh, Olivia McGee Lockhart. And many of you may have heard her, her name. She was a, a teacher here in Indianapolis for many years. And she is the historian for the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And in around 2012, there was another uh, library student who gathered um, some individuals together and he uh, wanted to start backing up, scanning images and different uh, materials from churches in Indianapolis. And of course, Bethel was one of those churches and he ended up going to another position and so he left the state his name was Rodney Freeman but myself and Dr. Andrea Copeland at IEPUI we continued to to meet and work with this project and then bringing on several people and as we were working on this project it became uh, apparent that the building would need to be sold and our goal, our mission is what can we save? What could we save? And so you see me here at the church with um, the church historian, Mrs. Lockhart, and we're looking at some of the materials that she has kept. One of the things that I love about what I do is that I get to work with individuals in the community. She had kept these materials. Um, and before her, there was Frances, Miss Frances Stout, who kept them. She was the church historian, also a former teacher. And so they had kept this history of their congregation for many years. And so you can see that we have one of the early books. And so, and of course, trying to preserve and to make sure that information is available for others to continue to use uh, the materials were donated, the paper materials were donated to the Indiana Historical Society, and you can now see those online um, as part of the Bethel AME collections. They were processed and made available. Um, IEPUI did a lot of the scanning, and they did a lot of the visual images, so all of that is available. But one of the unique things about what happened with the Bethel Project is that you now have the Bethel AME virtual project. The entire building was scanned by uh, the new media department at IEPUI, so students were scanning it, and so you can have a whole experience. And you can use virtual reality, VR, and you can go in and you can look and see what the building looks like. And so I bring all of that up because, and a lot of what I do working with individuals and working with people, different institutions to make sure that history is preserved, history is collected and that history is being, um, sh being shared and that researchers can use it. So this was a very large, uh, uh, large project. As you can see, um, we, the building was sold in um, 2016 and the congregation still exists and the members worship um, in their new building um, on Scienceville Road here in Indianapolis. So I talked about how the paper, the manuscript materials went to the Indiana Historical Society. At the Indiana State Museum, we collect objects. And so I was really happy that we were able to acquire one of the early pews. Now, this pew is, is very long <laughs> and it was on the balcony me of the church building. So uh, if you've been in the building, there's the main foyer and then there was a balcony. And this, uh, when the building had renovations, some of the older pews were moved to uh, the top. And so this is one of the older pews. And, and it was going to be a challenge to get this pew down. And when uh, the construction workers, the workers went in, they uh, took the piece down 
the queue down and they kept it in a spot until we were able to acquire it. And I am so excited to have this piece in the collection because we can use this object to help tell the story of Bethel AME. And I'll give you a little bit of history about Bethel AME. It, um, it's a long standing, long running congregation here in Indianapolis. It's, uh, the building still stands, it's at 414 West Vermont Street. It, there's a lot of construction going on around it and it will now be part of a hotel system. But the history of that building, that particular building goes back to 1869. It is a, a national landmark. It's on the National Registry. And but the congregation itself goes back to 1836. So you can see why it was so important for, for all of us to work together to preserve this history and to share and to be able to collect the paper and to collect artifacts. The congregation had a school um, during the time they were helping individuals to uh, volunteer to serve in the Civil War. I mean, the, the rich history, the beginnings of the um, Indianapolis uh, chapter of the NAACP, there's so much rich history there and there's so much that we can share. And because we tell our stories through artifacts and objects, this is a wonderful piece to be able to tell and share that story. We also look at things that are part of our history. I started here in Indianapolis looking at a project that included a lot of individuals, but this particular piece here um, is a hod, and as you can see, there's a there's a pole, and um, there's a wood uh, piece, on, and it would be used to hold bricks. I mean. Uh, and everything. And it's from the Weaver Settlement. And the Weaver Settlement is one of the early Black settlements here in Indiana. We know that there were many uh, communities here in this state, all over the state. And Weaver was in Grant County. And one of the wonderful things about Weaver is that there are still many descendants here in the city and in that area. And if you're really interested in learning more about the uh, Weaver community, there's an exhibit and there's an online exhibit available through the Marion Public Library. And you can go to their website and learn a little bit more about the family and the individuals who were uh, living there. Some of the family names are, uh, include the Pettifords and the Weavers. And I had the opportunity to work with descendants on another project. And it, I used a lot of their images because, that, again, that family had kept those images. And so it was really wonderful to be able to use um, historic images to help tell the story. That particular project was called Hoosier Renaissance. So it was a very glamorous picture from early African-American families and things. And so, but this goes back to that the um, early settlement. And this piece was donated by Ms. Dolores Betts, who also donated the materials at the Marion Public Library. So again, collecting from all over the state because we want to be able to tell the stories and history from throughout the state here at the Indiana State Museum and historic sites. This piece here, um, I smile at this piece because I remember, I, I really do like to share the stories of how we acquire pieces and how we um, gather different materials. And so this piece I was called, um, it's a meat slicer. And uh, it, it actually has a pedal so, uh, base that uh, you'll see in the next image. And uh, it was donated by the original owner's daughter uh, who lived here in Indianapolis, and um, it belong, belonged to Frank Ezel Mars Sr. And he came here from um, Arkansas. He was born in Marion, Arkansas in 1901. And he came to Indianapolis, and he would establish a grocery store. Um, now, the building that he had used had already been a grocery store, but he would open his store, Mars Grocery Store, at 1047 um, West Street. And so this particular piece was used in the grocery store. I'll go ahead and show you the base. So the two pieces come together. And 
this piece is really heavy. <laughs> so this was this uh, was also really interesting in in getting it. So I remember going to pick it up from the donor's home, and waiting in the car, waiting for backup to come and pick the piece up because it is it is a very a sturdy piece, and and that was that was really interesting. But I, I had the help. So I was going um, to pick up the piece. And what is really wonderful about this piece is that I can use it to tell so many different stories because I'll go back for a second. This piece was actually made in Logansport, Indiana. So I can tell the story of Indiana business. And that's always uh, great to be able to tell Thing about things that are made here in the state. And so you can't, unfortunately, I'm sorry, you can't see all the patent numbers and the information in this image, but it is there. You can see the block for it, but it was made in Indiana. And, but also because I can tell the story of an African-American business owner and an early African-American business owner. So this is from the newspaper, the Indianapolis Recorder, the African-American newspaper that was here in Indianapolis and continues to be published today. So uh, this is a picture of um, Mr. Ezell F. Mars. And as you can tell from the information here, he was an associate pastor at Mount Perrin and he's buried in Crown Hill. I love newspapers because they give you different pieces of information that you can use to look other places. And so I really like being able to use that. You can t um, read here that he was a native of Marion, Arkansas. His address was at 1240 West 26th Street. And he had lived here for 49 years and was owner and operator of Mars Grocery Store um, for 17 years. We learned that he taught the Henry Ball Bible class at Mount Perrin and had studied at Central District Theological Seminary. Also that he was a Democratic precinct committeeman in the seventh ward. So you get a really full picture of who Mr. Mars was from, from just from this short snapshot. Now, to be fair, the donor remember working in the grocery store. So the donor had actually worked in the grocery store. Um, the His daughter was there. So they had told me a lot about him. So I, I started with, with a good set of information, but just having this uh, newspaper source, which is again, another piece to add to documentation and providing information. So I said that his address uh, for the store was 1047 West Street. The initial business that was there was Harry Williams First Class Meat Market. So again, using the recorder, going back and being able to see what had been there before, because it's about objects so we can tell those things but what else can we tell to help put those stories together and so we found that and then I being able to locate that on the map and see where it was and I, I used the 1941 because um, and these are all available through the IEPUI um, database but here's 1047 um, we know that Mr. the Williams store had been there um, much earlier, and we know that Mr. Mars had had his grocery store there in the 1940s. So it would have been located um, here. I kind of cropped this, but you can see over here we have the um, Christmas Addicts High School would have been up here. So we have there, and then Mr. Mars lived um, here. In, in this address during um, part of the time that he lived here in Indianapolis. And so I went to the city directory again, what are the sources that I can help to put Mr. Mars in the community and, and just can further can tell his story. So you can see here, Mars Ezel F. Grocer 1047 Northwest. So just all these tools that we're able the hell and I just added this image here of the the kind of the just a Google map from today to give you a general sense of where what this looks like kind of now and I wanted to add this piece here um, because it really gives a little sense of of Mr. Mars and it says EF Mars proprietor of Mars Grocery 1047 Northwest Street has returned from a 10-day motor trip visiting Detroit, 
Buffalo, New York, Niagara Falls, Washington, D.C., and several points in Canada. And I'm like, he has a grocery store, he's traveling, and you really get a sense of who he was. Now, another part of the collection that we did not keep was uh, because um, we, we work a lot and, and share different information with um, the Indiana Historical Society. He had um, four books talking about his rental properties because he also owned properties and rented them out. And so you can find those at another uh, repository if you're interested in looking at that information. So from the meat slicer, I'm able to get and to share a little bit more about Mr. Mars. And, and it came from someone calling, wanting to donate this piece of their family history. And from that, we have an Indiana business story, an Indiana, Indiana African-American entrepreneur story. So all those things working and coming together. And then I just threw these in here um, also because just showing you know, advertisement, advertisements for the business. And I noted his address at one time for his home uh, being at the 1031. So you notice in the other materials that I've talked a lot about the Indianapolis recorder. And we have a few pieces related to the recorder here. And I wanted to share these because I like the little pieces of things that you can find in documents. I, I really like going through documents and different things. So you can see Mr. George P. Stewart, the Indianapolis Recorder, 518 520 Indiana Avenue. Again, connecting it back to the community and with the location being on Indiana Avenue, uh, which is different from its current location uh, on Tacoma. But then you, you have the installation document for the linograph company. But what I love about the envelope is that you get to see what this is supposed to look like, this linograph. So you get to see what it's supposed to look like. You get to see some, some adding and the figuring of numbers. But if you, one of the things that I wanted to bring to your attention is this note down here. And it says, hotel, five days and meals going and coming fair from Springfield, Ohio to, to Indianapolis and return. And so you can see where the gentleman has come from and to get here and then his return and the, the, um, the covering of the hotel for five days and the meals. So that was really interesting to me. It's like that this person, you know, had, um, who was completing and he arrived here and that he installed this. And this is um, in 1918. So you can show that. And then we have, again, the linograph company and then um, that it has been installed, uh, what the payment and all of those things. And so you just get this kind of, again, presentation of what was taking place with this business at this time and with the Indianapolis recorder being so important to what I do to what many um, researchers in the community and not even for researchers um, I talk a lot about research but just for what it shares and information I mean being able to have that as a resource to help tell the stories that I tell is really important so um, having these pieces, again, helps us to just continue to tell that story. And, and this was donated by a former owner of the newspaper, and it has been used to help share um, the story of journalism in Indiana, but also African American history. Okay, so some of kind of the fun and a different take and a different look. And I want to start with uh, this piece here. Um, here comes the judge. And I, I always smile when I think about this, this, this piece just because it's a, a little different take on um, uh, presentation. So this piece and all the pieces here, many of you probably guessed who they belong to, um, being that they belong to Judge C. Major, 
Judge Z Mae Jemison. And so um, this is, uh, was donated from her family. So we have her robe. Uh, we have the gavel and then we have this um, piece because what I like about this is because it's, um, it, it, it provides a little light to everything that, um, all the different things and activities that she would have been participating in. And so I really uh, like sharing this piece because it is, it's just, it's just a little different. And then it's also a little, it's a take on um, a television um, program um, from the 1960s, 70s, um, laughing. And so um, that, that this was shared and this was one of hers. Um, Judge uh, Jemison had a very long career here in Indianapolis. Um, she graduated from Shoreridge High School and she had her bachelor's and master's degree from Indiana State University before she went on to get her law degree from the College of Law at The Ohio State University in 1977. She was the first black woman to be appointed a Superior Court judge and this happened in 1988. And um, this was done by um, Governor Orr. And so you can see her there with her husband, um, Mr. Robert Jemison Sr. And um, she became very active and involved and she would eventually run for mayor. She would run um, for mayor as a Democrat in 1995. And one of the things that she was extremely proud of was her work with um, establishing drug courts. So all of these materials came from her family members and um, I had the opportunity to uh, talk to them and get some information from them again to help uh, tell the story, to help provide information. And one of the things that they had, they had a scrapbook and it was from her time when she was running for mayor and so I could follow along with different activities and things that she was um, participating in taking part in doing through this scrapbook and although we do not acquire the scrapbook we have the images so again we can use that information at some point um, as we're um, putting materials out and sharing things the role has, we have used that several times um, to help share the story because again, just showing, uh, telling the story of someone who was a first in a couple of different ways. So those are the things that belong to Jim, Judge Jemison. And uh, this is, of course, this is Mr. John Leslie West Montgomery. Uh, he was born in Indianapolis and he would become a legend <laughs> uh, as far as musician. Uh, you see him playing his guitar and he actually did not begin to play the guitar until around the age of 19. And he had a unique style because he would play with his thumb. And so he would uh, play and that became his unique style. Um, you see his brother, uh, Muck, and you see his brother, um, Buddy, on uh, the piano. So you have the Montgomery family, which were um, so important to the Indiana Avenue musical story and the history, and each of them being um, talented musicians. And so, um, Acquiring this collection was was very special and very interesting. We had had the guitar for an exhibit early in our opening here at this particular site here on West Washington Street. So we had borrowed that and we had made it part of the museum experience. But when you borrow things, you return them. And so we had still been involved and still contact in contact with the family. And so I was away and I get a call and it was a very joyous call that the family, uh, his daughter in particular, his daughter was ready to donate materials to the museum. So I was very happy, very, very happy. We went to their home, um, the home that they lived here in Indianapolis and sat down, had a wonderful call um, conversation with his daughter. 
And at the end of the conversation, you know, we talk about how we will care for the materials because these are materials. Um, I'll show you an object later that I literally took off the wall. So this is a very significant, important story. And with everything that we do, we want our donors to our donors to know that we will care for the materials that we will preserve, and that we will. Um, hope to have them around for many generations to come to come and visit and see these things and to see their family history which is Indiana's history and so we acquired um, several pieces and images that day it was it was truly one of those moments where you are just so excited to um, be a part of this and, and having that collection come here to the museum definitely was one of those. So you can see here is one of his nominations um, for best original jazz composition. This was in 1965. And this is his gold album from A Day in the Life. And, and when I say I took this off the wall, I took this off the wall. Like it was still, I mean, and this is what is, it, you know, just how important these materials were to the family and to her. It was still hanging on the wall. And um, and now it's here, so it's it's a very special piece. It was it was still hanging on the wall. Um, this is his Golden Mike Award, and he had a lot of a lot of awards, <laughs> very accomplished. And then this one um, was was really interesting. Um, I do not do. I work with really great people who know how to do a lot of different things outside of what I do. And so our then conservator, her name was Gabby, um, Gabby Kites, and she contacted the individuals who actually make the Grammys. And she had a conversation and how do we put this back together? Because we, as you can see, it's not in its, uh, in its glamorous state. And so she talked to them. We even were able to acquire a new front plate. And there you go. Um, this was the work of our conservator and it is it is beautiful. This and this is his Grammy. I probably would have never thought I would bring in a Grammy, but so happy that I did. She did a wonderful blog about this and you can find that through the Indiana State Museum website, um, looking up its blog. So, and she talks about her experience um, contacting the individual who makes the Grammy. So uh, again, a great story and working with uh, various people here that we have on staff and then contacting another organization also to know how to do it. So you can uh, see all of that there. And again, this, this is a very talented family here in Indianapolis. So we acquired the uh, West Montgomery pieces in 2009. Charles Buddy Montgomery passed away um, in 2009. And in late 2009, his family contacted us about having the pieces come to the museum. Again, very happy because putting the whole family story together. So I was really, really excited to get, uh, get these pieces. As you can tell, I get excited about a lot of things, but you should have joy in what you do. So again, I was very excited. So the family arranged for the pieces to come to Indianapolis. So they came in these um, large cases and um, we were able to acquire his vibraphone, which is what he played. He played the piano, but he also played the vibraphone. And so they were in these um, large black cases that you can see. And I just added this in here because it's continental. And this is this is from 1994. And I just thought, what an interesting piece of history just in the domestic tag there. Um, so I added that in there. So um, I'm, I'm showing you the, the pieces um, as they're being put together. I could not ever begin to put this piece together. So his family, his wife actually contacted Butler University here in Indianapolis. And there was a gentleman there uh, by the name of John Cravio, 
who came over and showed us how to put the piece together. So this is only just a, a part of, of him putting together. He spent an afternoon putting it together. There was another um, person in the room who could also see what was going on because we did eventually put it together to put it out um, in the museum as part of the museum experience. And he put this together for us and it was just, it was, it was great because now we would know how to do it. So I took several images, several photographs, so that when it's time for us to do it again, as it as it had been, we would have it um, put together. So this is how it looks all together. So this is um, Buddy Montgomery's vibraphone. And um, so we don't, we're still you know, of course, always collecting, but to be able to have um, so many pieces from such a talented family, roots here in Indianapolis, this, this is wonderful. So, uh, and that belonged to his brother. And I'm going to conclude my remarks looking at one of our um, major collections. This collection, uh, many of you probably recognize the face, is uh, Major Taylor. Marshall Major Taylor, who was born here in Indianapolis in 1878. And this is a collection that um, was actually acquired well before I got here. Um, Mr. Dale Ogden, who uh, used to be here at the museum, uh, worked to acquire this collection. And this collection is truly a collection. We have nine scrapbooks. We have letters. And when I say letters, Mr. Major Taylor wrote letters. There, I mean, there are letters that are over seven and eight pages, front and back. So he wrote, he, he was a writer. And I'll explain a little bit more about why he was writing and who he was writing to. We have his mailbag, we have tags from his luggage, and we have postcards and we have images. So we're able to really tell a full story about Major Taylor. And then even uh, more important, because Major Taylor told us his story because he wrote his autobiography and you can look at that autobiography online through google books it's the full and complete um, autobiography it's the um, autobiography of major taylor and um, i like being able to share the words that people have left for us so i quote major taylor quite often like I said, he was born in Indianapolis in 1878, and he would spend uh, his most of his youth, youth here, and he was a champion cyclist, a champion cyclist. He would leave Indianapolis in 1895 and go to Worcester, uh, Massachusetts, and when he left, he left with a gentleman by the name of uh, Lewis Bertie Munger, who had been a cyclist and who had a bicycling manufacturing shop here in Indianapolis. And he would take him, and he said he would return, um, Mr. Munger said this, that he, Major Taylor would return as the champion cyclist of the world. And he did. By 18, um, so he left here in 1895. In 1896, he would be a professional. By 1898, he had set seven world records. And by 1899, he had become the second um, champion, African American champion in the world in a sport when he won the World One Mile Championship in Montreal. So his uh, beginnings here in Indianapolis to become a world champion and then later international superstar, international champion athlete. And so this is his, one of his uh, loving mugs, loving cups. And this one is silver. And this was given to him by an American who was living in Paris. He won this in Paris. And this is from May 27, 1901. And all of that information is actually um, written here. So you can kind of see uh, Delancey War here. And so this is one of the pieces that we have in the collection. I told you that he liked to rate. And this is, he's sending this to his wife, Mrs. Mrs. Major Taylor. Her name was Daisy Victoria Morris. Uh, and they were married in 1902. 
and they had their daughter, Rita Sidney Taylor in 1904. And he talks about, he says, good morning. I hope it is. Um, and he talks about how it had rained here um, where he was and he's been and how he's trying to train and that he hopes that she is well. So we get to see his handwriting. And then this one, and I, I use this postcard all the time because it's to his daughter, Sydney, and her name is Rita Sydney Taylor. And she is the individual who the, actually donated the materials to the museum in 1988. And it says, I hope Sydney is a good little girl from your dad. And I was like, it's so sweet. Like, just, just being able to get that part, you know, and I love, I just love I, I really appreciate this piece and, um, you know, being able to share that. So I'll move on. <laughs> so uh, this is one of his letters. So you notice up there is a four. So four. So he's, uh, he's writing on front and back of this. And he talks about it being Friday and how it's had been rainy and cold weather here and how he um, wants to be able to train and get on his bike and different things. And so you can see again, Major Taylor as as a writer um, and sharing and, and writing to his, his wife. And it's interesting because what I love about his letters is that we get a lot of information about what's going on in his life. Like when he's going to the track, um, I learned a little bit about what he was eating, like his diet through um, one of his letters. Um, some of his things that were happening to him because Major Taylor, yes, he was a champion cyclist. He was a, a seemed to be a very calm spirit, but cycling was hard and he went through a lot of struggles. He was the champion cyclist, but there were times in the States where he had to find a place to stay, um, be, uh, where he would need to stay with um, African-Americans. And there were times where he received notes telling him, um, you know, things that were um, not nice. And that uh, there's one particular note or, or record where uh, writers are trying to encourage, I'll, I'll use the word encouraging him to leave. Um, yes, I, I use that word. And, and he, there were many times where he was racing, where they would try to harm him. I mean, so he, he had a lot that he was experiencing. He, he talks about the monster prejudice. So he experienced a lot of different things. And because through, and we learn about that through the newspapers, scrapbooks that we had, and, and, and a little bit from some of the letters and through his diaries. And why I use this piece is because you think, I think about how we all leave like a record, like in case of emergency. Well, this is one of his in case of emergencies. My name is Major Taylor. I am from Worcester, Mass. In case of accident, please notify Miss Gertrude Taylor and then gives her address in Chicago, Illinois. And that is his sister. And I just, it's like we never get too old to let somebody know what is going on and to help us. Um, and then this piece here is one of the scrapbooks. I mentioned earlier that we have nine of them. And this really is a chronicle of his professional life. Uh, and even actually before um, he, you know, he started in so many races. This is his early history. You can see up here. Sorry about that. The major doing well. You can have this a little note um, there. Uh, Taylor's making friends. So you can see just different things that uh, are going on. And we have nine of these, and these are full. And so uh, we, uh, as you can see, there's different tissue paper in between the pages. So we are doing our best to try to preserve them. However, we have digitized all of the scrapbooks. So we do have a record of those. Um, but we are, again, always trying to preserve and care for them as we have there. And then just uh, another great image of Major Taylor on, on his bike. 
and just again to celebrate who he is. And I wanted to come in there because we are actually working on right now a new experience that will open sometime in uh, the spring of 2022 um, that will look at the career of Major Taylor. And with this experience, we're really going to look at Major Taylor as a civil rights icon because he he was a first and he experienced so many different things and he be, writes and talks about wanting to improve things for his race and we're going to look at that and examine that and so again that's um in the future and it's coming out but we are working on it right now and because we have this collection we have the objects and the images to help tell his story and it's, it's really provides us a good foundation to start and to tell those stories. And there are many individuals that I didn't mention and many collections that I didn't mention that we have here. So we do invite you to come to the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites, um, not only in Indianapolis, but the sites around the state to learn about the rich history of Indiana to learn about um, the rich history of the state and the rich history of African Americans living in this living in this state. Thank you very much, and hopefully we can answer some questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Kisha. Yes, um, we still have a few more minutes. So, if you anyone have any questions out there? Well, I definitely have a question, so let me throw out the first one. <laughs> I was wondering um, what it's like working with donors. Do they typically approach the museum with things that they would like to donate? And is it hard for them to part ways with those donations when they're giving it over to the, the museum? What is that like for you? So working with donors, um, this is going to sound, but it's, it's actually the truth, it can be a lot of fun. So going to individuals' homes, like going to uh, Mr. Montgomery's daughter's home and sitting down and talking to her and taking the materials uh, off, off the wall and getting those things from her. So um, that, can, that was a lot of fun. And so, yes, but, you know, we spend a lot of time before we acquire the pieces. We spend a lot of time before we acquire the pieces because we're going out and we are talking to them, assuring them that we will take good care of the pieces, explaining our process because I cannot just bring in something into the collection because I want it to be here. So I um, have to go before a committee. We have a collections review committee and I make the case for things that I want to bring in and how they help to tell the story. Why are they relevant? How will they be used? And so we, I truly um, make that case before um, every piece that I bring in. So um, the, like I said, the Taylor collection was already here, but anything that I'm bringing in right now, I am trying to find support and evidence to um, document and, and give reasons why this is so important and why we should have it here at the museum and how it can be used not only here in the in this particular museum but maybe like for example i do a lot of work with the Catherine Coffin State Historic Site um, in Fountain City and why I would need different objects or stories or research materials to share there. And so just throughout the system and being able to, to do that. So, um, and plus you get to meet really wonderful people who, who have a true interest and support and want to share their family history. And, and I think that's that, that is very rewarding. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I always feel like the the relationship with the donors lasts after the donation happens too. Yeah. Like sometimes I want to come in and check on it, but um, yeah. yeah. And we'll see how it's yeah. doing. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. It um, definitely feels like a, an evolving relationship for sure. <laughs> Yes, we um, we acquired a pieces, some pieces a couple of years ago, and the um, 
gentleman had, was a boxer. And so his family invited us to come to, he, he's passed away, but they invited us so that we could come to the induction ceremony where he was going to be inducted into the um, Boxer Hall of Fame. And so, uh, yes, it, there is a relationship and we do get sometimes get emails from that particular um, donation that that particular collection donation um so uh, just again and then sometimes you get additional pieces you know from from that from a particular donation so um you you build a relationship and then they'll uh, find something else and they'll um, donate some different things i have a, a great example of that uh, the individual who donated the materials from the Indianapolis Recorder is donating some additional materials. And one of the pieces is a piece that I will definitely use as soon as I bring it into the collection because it talks about a particular um, business that was here in Indianapolis that dealt with um, African-American realty. So I'm really looking forward to be able to um, use that in the near future um, we have rotations so you know when i can put things out are, is on a schedule i can't just go and you know <laughs> do, do something like that so eventually it will be put out and it may not be and it, it will definitely not be in the next month or, but you know maybe in the next year that is amazing and and when is the major taylor exhibit opening That's... um so that is um that the specific date has not been determined, um, but we're looking at 2022. Okay. That's, that's yeah, 2022. yeah, that'll be here faster than we know it. <laughs> it, will. it will. Now, um, what is the museum open currently, and, and how has it been? You know, working during uh, COVID at the museum. So the museum is open. We are open Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, this, uh, and you can check our website for uh, additional information, but we are open. Um, the IMAX is open, our sites are open, and it has, um, has been fine. We are actually collecting and looking to collect things from the COVID experience. So we are continuing to collect um, and to bring things in during this time, continue to do programming. Um, I, would, I would encourage everyone to look at our events and our educational programming um, that is available because that is, that is all still uh, happening and occurring. So yes, we are open. Please come and visit. Yes, please do. Um, any other questions out there? Is that the New Hope folks? Yeah, go ahead. My question is, so what is your oldest collection, Keisha? What's the oldest artifact that you have in the collection? Oh my, so in the collections that I work with, um, I have to think about that because I, am, I work with a, a set of curators and so um, the natural history, their, their objects are extremely old. Um, they, uh, we have prehistoric objects. So um, that collection is, is a lot older than my collection. And, but in the, I'm trying to think some of the earliest pieces, uh, things that I have brought in, I would think from just from the objects that I work with, probably the pieces that are from the Weaver settlement would be. And that's that's just speaking specifically to what I work with. But like I said, we have um, natural history curators who have fossils and and materials that are, are much older than the materials that I work with. I, I'm in cultural history as opposed to natural history. But good question, thank you. So for me, it would probably be um, the pieces from a, a objects that I work with would be the pieces from the settlement. Thank you. Very cool. Any other questions out there? I have a comment from Joanna Reese. It says that four of the attendants here today are first year grad students in the public history program at IUPUI. So she said this is great information oh, and she you. loves seeing your, your passion. Thank you. Uh, yes, wonderful. 
Yes, it is a wonderful program. And it is. If you have a chance to take one of Kisha's classes, I recommend it. Are you just over at the library school side? Or do you yes, do I am just with the library school side, but don't you have the public history? Yes, I have yes you history. have the public history degree. Yes. yes, I am just in the library, um, library side. So um, I, I always say, you know, I am a librarian who never worked in a library, um, but I love, and, and being here at the museum allows me the opportunity to go to repositories and libraries all the time. And right now, of course, we're all doing it online, but um, just the collections that help me to tell the stories of the objects that we have in these collections, it's wonderful. It's good. So, uh, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so wonderful. So I think that, that's a great note to end on. And I just want to thank you so much. You. It, it was a pleasure and an honor to share space with you today. Um, thank and you. thank you all for coming out and, yes. and listening to this pre awesome presentation. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. I'll stop the room.